Who are the Raging Cajuns? We're going to know all about Louisiana by the time this episode is over. It's a Locked On Crossover Edition as we get ready for Tennessee's first round game in the NCAA Tournament against Louisiana. That's coming up today and more right here on Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, everybody? Welcome to it. This is Locked on Vols, and I'm your host, Eric Kane. So glad that you elected to hang out with us here today on Locked on Vols. It's going to be a fun show. Got a couple of guests on today. We're going to do a little Locked on Crossover Edition here in segment number one, David Schultz in two. David Schultz of Locked On Sunbelt is going to join the show, and we're going to kind of go back and forth, tell him a little bit about Tennessee, and he's going to tell us a little about a little bit about Louisiana getting preparation for uh, Tennessee and Louisiana, the four, the thirteenth seeded matchup Thursday night, tomorrow night at nine forty Eastern time to begin the NCAA tournament. So we have that to look forward to here on a Wednesday. Josh Ward is coming up towards the end of the show. And so we got a whole lot in store today and uh, buckle up. It's going to be a fun ride. But real quick, this episode is brought to you in part by FanDuel Sportsbook. Official sportsbook on Locked On. Make every moment more with FanDuel by visiting FanDuel.com slash Locked On to go ahead and get started today. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. Subscribe where you find your listening podcast. You can always find us online on Twitter at Locked On Balls and at underscore Caner. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. David Schultz of Locked On Sunbelt for the Locked On crossover. All right, we got a little Locked On crossover edition. David Schultz of Locked On Sunbelts and Dom Eric Kane here at Locked On Balls. First round matchup. It's going to be a late one. Thursday night, 940 Eastern time. You got fourth seeded Tennessee going up against the 13th seed Louisiana. Uh, David, for Tennessee fans who don't know anything about the Raging Cajuns, anything about the basketball program, the first time they heard that they had a basketball team might have been on, on Selection Sunday. Tell us just a little bit about this Louisiana club, a team that's capable of, capable of beating you if you don't show up. Yeah, a little, a little history first, right? So this is where Andrew Tony, when it was probably Southwest Louisiana, went. Uh, and they had some you know, issues with the coach back in the day, bringing in African-Americans, and that was frowned upon. Uh, at the time, and they found a little rinky-dink rule that may have been broken, like a plane ticket was paid for or something like that. And so they went on probation, and it's taken a long time for them to recover. So Bob Marlin ends up taking them to the uh, NCAA tournament. They won the Sun Belt in 2014. Sean Long was inside. Alfred Payton, who went from a zero-star recruit to a lottery pick, uh, they, he led them to the uh, NCAA tournament where they lost to Doug McDermott and Creighton. Uh, this one is a little bit different because uh, they have a bunch of Robins to the Batman. The Batman mm -hmm. is Jordan Brown. And we'll get to, you know, what, you know, the big thing is, is how are they going to defend Jordan Brown uh, against South Alabama in the first two games that they played the Jaguars? He was 22 of 27 combined. He missed a combined five shots in the second game. I think he hit six straight to begin the second half. And that was basically the ball game. He is a monster. Uh, he had a 26 and 20 ball game this year. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Tennessee uh, defends him. The question is, who is going to be uh, the Robin? Themis Folks is, does not shoot three-pointers. He is the point guard, although in the Sun Belt Championship game, he made three uh, three-pointers, which gave him a grand total of 14 for the entire season. So he is a, he is a, a drive-and-dish kind of point guard. Uh, you do have Garnett on the outside. Uh to shoot it, but also Greg Williams, a local kid out of, out of Lafayette who uh, was banged up in the Sunbelt tournament. And we'll see if he comes back and you got uh Delacorte as well, who can defend and shoot it. But you also have some size, Terrence Lewis, uh, the second and uh, Joe Charles off the bench. So it is, it is a deep team. It is an athletic team. They're the polar opposite of Tennessee. They want to get up and down and they want to score and the one thing they will do is they will fight you off the three-point line. They will defend the three-point line. They will, you know, give up all the twos that you want, but they're not going to give up threes. And that was one of the keys to defeating South Alabama in the Sun Belt Championship game. Isaiah Moore doesn't shoot threes, although he made one in that ball game. He had 33 points, but the Cajuns come away with a victory because uh, South Alabama was only 3 of 10 from three-point land. 
It looks like Louisiana has three players that average in double figures. Of course, Jordan Brown, as you mentioned, uh, close to 20 points at 19.4. Mm. Greg Williams at 13 and Terrence Lewis at, uh, at 11. And you mentioned the three-point. I know talking about defending it, but kind of in my research, and tell me if this is on base or not, but it, it looks like offensively Louisiana can shoot the three. They just don't always yes. rely on the three. Like when they shoot it, they, they're typically efficient with it, but that's not necessarily their game offensively. Is that is that right? Oh, no, he's an analytical guy. Yes, he wants no. to shoot. It was a big deal for me when I was covering the Cajuns back in the day. Uh, they would they shoot threes and layups. They are Alabama. That's what they like to do. Now, against South Alabama in the uh, Sunbelt Championship game, they turned Jordan Brown because they were double-teaming him. They turned him into a jump shooter, and he can make a 15-foot jumper if, if you leave him open. No, but they are looking to shoot threes or layups, uh, get fouled, go to the line. That is the one issue that they have. They are not a good free throw shooting team. Jordan Brown is not a good free throw shooter. These games tend to come down to that, so that could be an Achilles heel uh, for the Cajuns. But, no, they want to shoot threes, and they want a lapse. They are not a, a mid-range shooting team. Well, it's funny because Tennessee is a horrific free throw shooting team as well. So, I think I no. did see a stat to where, like, I think Tennessee may be in the 200s and Louisiana may be in the 300s in terms of field goal or free throw percentage. Or it, it's both teams are way down there, which is not great. Um, how has Louisiana been in big time uh, games this season? I, I see the the combined quad one and quad two record, I believe, is one and five. Uh, when, when they've been on that stage against a power five opponent or whomever, kind of how have they looked? Well, they got rocked by Texas uh, earlier on the season, but then I think they went on like a, a well, I, I think they lost their first two ball games in the Sun Belt, but they collected themselves and they won 10 straight. And they had a big ball game at home against Marshall, which was maybe bigger for Marshall, and they couldn't do it. Uh, they beat Southern Miss at home. Uh, and then they they stubbed their toe a little bit, honestly. They, they lost to Southern Miss. Uh, Southern Miss had their biggest crowd in five years there, almost 8,100. Uh, so that was a factor. They had some travel issues getting to Troy's. They... Uh, did not uh, play well in the second half. And then they lost a third game in there. Uh, so they lost three of four. But the schedule kind of turned. They got Arkansas State at home. And then uh, South Alabama, which is a bad matchup for South Alabama. And then they kind of ran through the Sun Belt Championship. They got a double bye. Uh, they took care of Georgia Southern with, e with ease. Texas Southern is just one of those pain in the backside teams that should not be very good, but are very good. And you know, 12-point leads turned into two really quickly because mm -hmm. they just don't go away. And it doesn't matter how good you are. They just don't give up. Uh, and South Alabama was playing very well. So, uh, you know, they they, they could have easily lost to, uh, to Texas State. And they could have easily lost to South Alabama. Uh, but they were the best team in the Sun Belt. They were the preseason pick. Uh, some teams, Marshall and Southern Miss, had some huge turnarounds from the year before. Uh, but uh, they are very talented. Uh, when they went to um, – play again uh, Creighton Sean Long got into foul trouble this is a decade ago and so it was it was a tough a tough deal because Sean Long was playing very well uh, at the time I think they tied it early in the second half but they just could not hang because he continued in foul trouble and that'll be one of the keys if if Jordan Brown or the game is not called where every little touch foul is uh, is uh, the whistle is blown they uh, you know they, Jordan Brown can hang he will be I'll be surprised Eric if Jordan Brown is not the best player on the court he could be the best player on the court a lot of times that is who wins a ball game, but maybe yeah. not in this case because it's it's a you know power five versus group of five. But Jordan Brown entering the game, Jordan Brown's the best player on the court. Yeah, and that's the last, last thing I have for you in terms of a scout here for Louisiana. Jordan Brown, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he signed at a high school in Nevada. Uh, with, yes. Yeah, and then he went to uh, Arizona, correct. and then now he's at Louisiana. Former five-star, right. six foot 11, 225 pounds. Again, 19.4 points per game, 8.7 rebounds per game. Why is he going to be the best player on the court? Not disputing that because I, I think you're right. What does he do well that's going to impact the game and give Tennessee trouble? Well, he is a rebounding machine. All yeah. right. Even when he only had like uh, 16 points, I think, against South Alabama, uh, I still think he had like 15 rebounds. Uh, he's a rebounding machine. He is not the most athletic of all guys, right? Uh, he's not necessarily going to beat you down the court. Uh, but he's going to block shots, and he's going to rebound, and he's really good getting the angles. He's really good with his pivot foot. He's really good with the pump fakes, and he's really strong, and he's really big. And they don't have those – we don't have those kind of guys in college basketball or anywhere for that fact of the matter uh, that much anymore. So he's a mismatch for most. And so when we come back, it'll be interesting your thoughts because I'm going to presume 
that Tennessee is going to see how good he is and then decide whether they double team him or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he did a good job getting rid of the ball against South Alabama. He had some turnovers. They were physical with him. uh, But, you know, his player, his uh, teammates stepped up. So it'll be interesting to see how he is defended uh, because he's he's really good. His father played for the Cajuns. Uh, They almost got him coming out of high school, but went elsewhere. And and now he's back and, you know, took him to the Sunbelt Championship game last year and and won the Sunbelt Championship this year. So he's, he's really good and he's tough to defend because, Not only is he good under the basket, but he can step away, you know, and hit an elbow jumper. Four-seeded Tennessee going up against the 13th-seeded Louisiana in the East region, 940 Eastern time, CBS, the telecast. That's coming up first-round action uh, for these two teams on Thursday night. David Schultz got locked on Sunbelt. Eric Kane locked on Vols, little locked on crossover edition. We'll talk about the Tennessee Volunteers when we return, but hey, it's just a little bit past the midway point of the NBA season. It's the perfect time to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's America's number one sportsbook. Plus, we're talking NBA here, but hey, it's NCAA tournament time. And you can put some coin in your pockets. You can bet on the money lines, the totals, the spreads, individual player props, all that and more with the NCAA tournaments. And that's over at uh, FanDuel Sportsbook. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. It's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe. It is secure. It is super easy to use. You can try everything from, again, the money line to the point scores, the three-pointers drain, number of rebounds. Those individual player props are super, super fun over at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same-game parlay. So don't miss your chance at no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets Back if you don't if you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That is fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, we are back. Locked on Sunbelt crossover edition with Locked On Vols host Eric Kane. We're talking Raging Cajuns basketball and Tennessee Vols basketball, 940, allegedly tip-off Eastern time on Thursday night. Uh, let's talk about the health of both teams. You know, Greg Williams got injured in the Sunbelt Conference tournament, but obviously uh, Zakai Ziegler is out with a uh, knee injury from the end of the season. Uh, how uh, how otherwise, how healthy is, uh, is Tennessee, Eric, heading into this matchup? You know, David, it's it's been a beat up team, man, and you know a lot of that's contributing to the five and seven record for Tennessee entering the NCAA tournament. Uh, but you know, outside of Zakai Ziegler, Tennessee's in good shape right now, right? Josiah Jordan James has missed a lot of the season in and out of the lineup with a knee injury. Uh, Julian Phillips has missed a lot of February's games with uh, with a hip flexor. Santiago Vescovi has never really looked right all year long. I think he's got a nagging shoulder. But all those guys are going to play. You just are not going to have your your all SEC point guard in Zakai Ziegler, who is one of the few guys offensively that can create a shot for himself for Tennessee. But a fantastic perimeter defender, arguably the best defender on this team, and the spark plug for Tennessee. Uh, that's the only one in Zakai Ziegler that's really going to be out. That's going to make a big time difference. All those other guys should uh, be in there and playing. But it's been an, an injury filled season for Tennessee, no doubt. So that, that is a tough thing because, you know, last week, if we were watching everybody, a lot of places had Tennessee playing a Louisiana. Uh, and then all of a sudden Duke won the ACC and then they switched it up and then it ended up being Tennessee because I think that's a good matchup for the Cajuns because of the injury to Ziegler. If this was – if Zakai Ziegler was in there, I would not give the Cajuns much of a chance. I think they have a shot to pull off this upset. Uh Usually, and this is two, they're two different kind of kind of teams, right? Cajuns want to get up and down, and Tennessee wants to be methodical. Uh, when you're looking at Tennessee's uh, wins, the other team rarely scores over 65. Yeah, I mean Tennessee's defense has been fantastic, but yeah. but again, you go back and watch those games since the Kai Ziegler, and you know outside of Ole Miss in the first round of the uh, SEC tournament, Tennessee's been giving up some points, right? 79 points to Missouri. In the quarterfinal round of the SEC tournaments, um, give up a lot. Uh, the, the the final game of the regular season, you know, with Auburn as well, got over seventy points. So there's some you know, there, there's some cracks in that in that foundation now that Zakai Ziegler is out, especially the perimeter defense. But Tennessee is a really good defense in terms of suffocating. Really good in terms of health defense. They play zone. They've also played man that can switch some things off and do a couple different things. Number one rated defense in the country in terms of uh, you know the, the defensive efficiency ratings and and Ken Palm as well for I want to say 
about 14 weeks now. So uh, this is a defense that is really, really you know solid, but it is it is not as good without Zakai Ziegler. I'm just going to point that out there. So you know we'll see. Um, it, it's going to be in- intriguing. They do a good job of adapting to different types of offenses. I think they can run with anybody, um, but the way they play suffocating defense, I'm intrigued to see how that hinders or, or faults the the pace of play and. The, the, the fast-breaking mentality type of trying to get up and down the court for Louisiana. I think it should be a good matchup, but Tennessee shut down some of the better offenses in the country this year, and uh, they're going to be up for the challenge on Thursday, I would imagine. All right, so then how do they go about defending uh, Jordan Brown, you know, the Cajuns inside post player? Do they start off double-teaming, or do they test him, or uh, how does that work? I don't think they start off double teaming him. I just think that you, you you have a rotation of bigs that's just going to try to get a little, little piece of him, right? I mean, he's a guy that's going to get his points. He's a guy that, and I think Tennessee will, will most likely take the approach of, you know, we don't want to let him take over the game, but he can get his as long as his Robins, you know, are, are, are not are, are kind of held in check or not having good days at the office, right? Um, he could, as you point out, very well be the best player on the court that day, but Tennessee could still come away with a win. So I think Tennessee will start with the Jonas Adu kind of on him, and then then Olivier Kumwa, then probably an Uros Plafsic, and then maybe a Toby Walk at the end. But I do think it'll be kind of a rotation, different looks, try to keep him off balance by throwing different looks at him. And, of course, the help defense will be there when needed if he you know goes from one block to the other, from the lane down to the block, whatever the case may be. All right, so who do you think, and it is a crossover edition, Locked On uh, Sunbelt and Locked On Vols, Dave Schultz, Eric Kay. All right, so uh, who do you think should be the key guy that the Cajuns have to uh, defend? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> you, you, you talk about... There's so many of them, or... Well, out, no, it, it, it's very inconsistent. I mean, the answer is Santiago Vescovi, okay? That's, okay? that's the easy answer, but, right. like... Tennessee has just been so inconsistent on the offensive end this year. It's it's been abysmal. But Santiago Vescovi is an all SEC first teamer. Okay, he is a good player. Um, there'll be some nights where he shows up and he's three of fourteen from the field. There'll be some nights where he shows up and he's nine of thirteen from the field. He will shoot the three ball, and he is a guy capable of you know getting you fifteen points every single game, whether he's hot from the field or not. He'll get to the free throw line. Um, and again, I, I don't think that he's been healthy all season long, but Santiago Vescovi is probably that easy answer. But here's the caveat there. Josiah Jordan James is capable of scoring you 25 if you don't watch out. Um, Olivier Comwa scored 27 against Texas. He had a double-double with 11 rebounds and 10 points the other night, but uh, he's been super inconsistent all season long. Zakai Ziegler, of course, was playing better than arguably anybody in the SEC for about a, a month stretch of the season, but you know he's out. So it's... It's Santiago Vescovi, but there are some other guys who are capable of jumping up and and kind of leading that team in scoring or helping Vescovi on a given night. It's just never been a consistent person you can count on. All right, so give me a number. The Cajuns average about 75 points a game, and Tennessee gives up a total of 58 points a game. What number do you start getting nervous at that it may be getting away from the Vols? In terms of points given up? Yeah, points. All of a sudden, the, all of a sudden the Cajuns are are – you know, closing in on 65, they're closing in on 70. Obviously, if they're not closing in on those numbers, Tennessee is going to be yeah. either going going to be right there or going to win it rather easily. Um, I'll say about 65. I mean, you know, Tennessee has not allowed opponents uh, over 70, but I think just a couple of times this season. Um, you know, typically they can win a lot of games. They can they can ugly up some games if they need to, especially on the offensive end if they're not having a good game. So, you know, if if, if Louisiana gets anywhere like sniffing around 65 or so, I think that's uh, that that's cause for sounding the alarm just a little bit because Tennessee has been just that good defensively all season long. All right, let's wrap it up here. A little uh, locked on crossover. Uh, myself, Dave Schultz, locked on Sunbelt, Eric Kane, locked on Vols. Rick Barnes get a bad rap. He's a really good basketball coach. I know he hasn't won as much as people would have liked, but he does a really good job and he's done it for a really long time. What are we looking at? Providence, Texas, and Tennessee. He's had a really solid career. And Clemson. And Clemson. Yeah. It, it, it's funny, man, because I mean, there's always that, and you know how it is. You've, you you cover sports for a long time. There's always that small minority that is all that is always the most vocal, right? And um, Rick Barnes, a Hall of Fame coach, he is a mm. good coach. It is absolutely 100 percent fair to have expectations raised here in Knoxville for the basketball team. That's 100 percent fair because Rick Barnes, what he's brought to Knoxville, you know, before Rick Barnes got to Knoxville, I, I've beg anybody to go and look at the history books, look at the record books. This was not a desirable place 
outside of a couple years here and there, and of course the Bruce Pearl tenure, to come and play basketball. Tennessee was not routinely a four or a three or a five, a top five seed in the NCAA tournaments. Um, five stars did not come to Knoxville to play basketball. Um, everything has changed since Rick Barnes has been here. The, the culture that he has instilled, Tennessee will never recruit the way it is right now. And Tennessee's being picked to go and play in these big time preseason, you know, tournament games or the, the Thanksgiving tournament games or the Christmas or whatever the case may be. That was never the case before Rick Barnes. So when Tennessee, Tennessee's been in the top 25 all season long, Tennessee's been in the top 10 for the majority of the season. And it's just kind of like a lot of times fans have just come to expect it. And you might be getting a little, uh, a little taking it for granted, if you will. But again, the other side of the coin is raising expectations is always fair. So Rick Barnes is 25 and 26 in the NCAA tournament. He's not very good in, in, in the second round. He's not been very good in the second round here at Tennessee. So uh, that, that is, that is cause for frustration for sure. But Tennessee is nowhere where Tennessee is in terms of a basketball school right now. It's just, it's incredible when you think about it 10 years ago, and then especially before Bruce Pearl, because there were some good years of Bruce Pearl, then it went kind of down in the dumps again, and then it was back up with uh, with Rick Barnes. But outside of those two tenures, it's not been a good place for basketball. I think I've been to, well, not I think, I've been to one Tennessee basketball game in Knoxville, happened to be Allen Houston setting the all-time Tennessee scoring record. Good one to go uh, to. did lose that ball game, though, to my Syracuse. <laughs> All right, guys, we've got a final segment left here of this Wednesday show. Great stuff there from David Schultz. First two segments, a little locked on crossover. Looking at the Louisiana uh, basketball team and what Tennessee is going to be in store for tomorrow night, late night, 940 Eastern Time tip. But it is Wednesday, so let's bring on our buddy Josh Ward. And Josh, right out of the, right out of the gate here, what do you think about Tennessee being a four seed in the NCAA tournament? Well, five seed got the earlier tip, so that might have been better. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, I think the the seeding is about right. I thought going into the weekend, four was a, a real possibility, especially if Tennessee lost to Missouri. A win against Missouri might have still had Tennessee on that four seed line. Three was possible. I, I think that they were just clearly above the five seed line by the time we got to conference tournament play. And Tennessee's resume is one that includes big-time wins, Texas and Kansas from the Big 12. That win against Alabama was a huge win for Tennessee's resume. The month of February was not good for Tennessee. So I, I think considering what Tennessee has done, good and bad, a four seed is justified. Now let's see how Tennessee can do in a region that has a bunch of good teams, but all these teams have question marks going in, including teams that Tennessee could potentially play. Need to take care of business, but in the next round, yeah, those teams still have a lot to prove despite some of their recent success. Yeah, on Sunday night, when my, kind of my immediate reaction when I'm looking at this East region, I'm like, man, Tennessee got arguably the toughest region. And I'll back I'll back down on that. I don't think it's the toughest region, but I think Tennessee's draw is pretty tough because yeah, Louisiana on Thursday, which Seth Greenberg's already saying, mm -hmm. hey, that's going to be uh, the, the trendy upset in round one. But you move on and play the winner of Duke and Oral Roberts, which – is is not going to be fun. And then if you win that one, you likely play number one Purdue. So uh, it, it's tough for Tennessee kind of any way you want to spin it. Maybe not the toughest region, but a tough draw for the Volunteers. Well, I do think it's tough, but I just – I don't think that's out here. I do think it's a year where there are no obvious great teams, at least a bunch of great teams at the top. But it is spread out to where a bunch of teams can be competitive – against one another like Oral Roberts is a team that if you look at the metrics look at Ken Palm is comparable to SEC teams that are in the NCAA tournament just behind Missouri and Mississippi State uh, that were able to get in and Tennessee fans know about how good Missouri is so like Duke's not guaranteed to be there in the Sweet 16 favored to be there but by six to seven points going into the first round and if you think about Tennessee's history Eric going on runs in the NCAA tournament a lot of the time the best runs were through unexpected paths. And when we look back at that Loyola Chicago loss, part of the reason that I think it's frustrating for Tennessee fans is because it was laid out there because other teams fell. So when Tennessee went to the Elite Eight in 2010, Tennessee was a six seed. There was no Elite Eight talk going into that tournament, at least not realistic. But then three seed Georgetown went down. So Tennessee beat Ohio in the next round. All of a sudden, your one went away, which Tennessee was able to pull off to get to the Elite Eight. 
in 2014, Tennessee was an 11 seed in the play-in round, but uh, took advantage, played really well against Iowa, uh, beat uh, a, a six seed, and then in the next round was Mercer because Duke was out. So you never know exactly what you're going to have to face. Just expect that you're going to have to face teams that are quality opponents because they're in, in the NCAA tournament for a reason. And by the way, if you, if you take on a, a lower-seeded team, the, the, quote, worst team, well, they might be hot when you face them, like a Loyola Chicago was. So there are no guarantees. That's why Tennessee needs to avoid what its problems have been the last couple of seasons, going completely cold, not showing up. If Tennessee shows up, even without Zakai Ziegler, it is still capable of going on a run. I, I know what you can say about the odds at this point. I understand it completely. But Tennessee is the favored team in this 14 bracket to come out of it, not Duke. When you look at the brackets overall, look at all four of these regions, kind of what do you think? Alabama getting the number one overall seed. Houston, Kansas, Purdue, the other four seeds. Uh, eight teams from the Southeastern Conference tying the Big Ten for the most from Power Five Conference that's in the field to play. You have Texas A&M that is a seven seed. Uh, kind of some of the highlights for me. What, what do you think about the bracket overall? Yeah, A&M is one of those teams that I think is underseeded. Uh, I like A&M a lot. Didn't play great against Alabama in the SEC championship game in the tournament, but nobody's beating Alabama this past week the way that they were playing. So uh, there, we, we can start out staying in, in Tennessee's region. Like Talking about you never know what you're going to have to face. If I'm Purdue, I'm not liking the fact that we get probably an underseeded FAU team or Memphis, which is playing like a top 20, top 25 team right now. Uh, beat up Houston, which was undermanned. Uh, the one seeds across the field, I, I like Alabama the best right now, but a week ago I probably wouldn't have said that going into the SEC tournament. I like Alabama's potential the most in terms of what it is when it plays its best. That as that SEC tournament team that we saw, I don't think it's losing to anybody uh, if it plays that way. Uh, Auburn, Iowa as a potential second round matchup for Houston, and it's going to be one of those teams. Uh, you know that's no good. Auburn's not had the season that it expected, but it's going to fight you until the end. And be no. really tough. Uh, I like Texas in that region. That's a team that Tennessee played earlier this season. Kansas, I personally think, is vulnerable. But you know, from the SEC, uh, Kentucky, I guess capable of going on a run. But I also wouldn't be surprised if it loses in the first round to Providence. That would we had to make first round upset picks on Josh and Swain on Monday, and that was Swain's. He went with Providence to knock off Kentucky as St. Peter's did a year ago. What does Tennessee have to do to advance past the round of sixty four and take down Louisiana? Well, Tennessee needs to lock in defensively because it has not done that against tournament teams over the last couple of weeks, at least since it started playing without Zakai. Big second half for Auburn, big second half for Missouri was too much for Tennessee to keep up with. Tennessee needs to take care of the basketball. Don't allow Louisiana to have extra opportunities. And then the bigs just need to fill their roles. You don't, you don't need the bigs for Tennessee to score a bunch of points, but they need to do a good enough job against Jordan Brown, who is a high major conference level player, probably should have been the player of the year in the Sun Belt, started his time at Arizona. Uh, Rick Barnes talked about him, how Tennessee recruited him. He is, he is a guy that would play a big role, I think, if he were on Tennessee's basketball team. So a big guy uh, that Tennessee will have to deal with. And then do everything you can to keep Louisiana from getting hot outside. They don't shoot a lot of threes. They make them. And uh, Williams, their senior guard, shoots at about a 40% rate from behind the three-point line. But Tennessee is the better team. Tennessee has a much better roster. And if Santiago Vescovi and Josiah Jordan-James can lead offensively, I don't think Louisiana can keep up. Last thing, this time next week when we speak, Tennessee will already have been two days into spring practice spring football practice and nothing yeah. moves the needle quite like spring practice um even when the NCAA tournament is going on I mean that that's that's true facts right there um what are you looking forward into what are you looking forward to seeing in terms of Tennessee any big storylines any newcomers any veterans position battles you're going to be intrigued to see the first couple of weeks yes yeah, step aside everything when football rolls into town uh yeah. it's already here winter workouts going on but that to me is why this spring is more intriguing because you have newcomers both from the high school signing class as well as transfers who are expected to play important roles and compete for starting spots to help replace guys that just left for the NFL so you know what are we going to learn about the offensive line I don't know but I'm curious to hear what's happening at the tackle and guard spots having to replace Darnell Wright who is a projected first round pick Eric his his emergence from 2021 to 22 is a big reason the offense became what it did 
the, the other guys obviously played huge roles, but they don't have that success without Darnell Wright playing the level that he did at tackle. So replacing yeah. him, Campbell coming in is important. Uh, secondary competition, that would probably be uh, next what I, what I would add. You can lead with that if you want to because you have transfer help coming in and Gabe Judy Lolly with a good chance to start. But freshmen that this staff likes a lot – that are on campus that will have a chance to compete. They upgrade the athleticism. So competition is a big part of it, but it's real because of all the newcomers. I mean, you have, what, a quarter of your roster, more than that maybe, that is on campus for the spring to get ready for the fall. Yep, looking forward to it. Spring practice that's beginning on Monday. And, of course, Tennessee in the NCAA tournament kicking off Thursday, 940 Eastern time. Are you excited about that tip-off time? I, I know that this is the internet, but I still shouldn't use the language that uh, comes to mind with that late tip-off. But that's okay. I just <laughs> I, I pray for no overtime in Duke Oral Roberts because 940 is, that's tentative. It could be a 10 o'clock tip uh, by the time we get started. But, hey, that's okay. Uh, as, as long as it's good basketball, I'm happy to stay up for it. Could be worse. I mean, I have to do on-camera work. And, and and not not just one or two things, like three or four things right after the game is over. So uh, I mean, I you have a pretty... face made for the camera, Eric. Know, so you'll be true. you'll be perfectly fine. It's a blessing and a curse. What's coming up on Josh and Swain this week? Yeah, we have a lot going on. Talking hoops ahead of the tournament. So uh, big look ahead to that, as well as to the start of spring practice as the week goes along. We'll do more football talk, and also we're going to be taking a look around the SEC, especially at Tennessee's opponents this upcoming fall. So some off season slash spring reports and uh, don't forget that Josh and Swain newsletter it's out every Friday we saw a little bump last week I think thanks to your plug on the show here on Locked on Vols Eric so thanks for that Josh and Swain.com subscribe every Friday morning uh, the Josh and Swain newsletter goes into your inbox hey I'll take that praise and if you're listening and watching right now and haven't subscribed to the Josh and Swain uh, newsletter the link is in the show details right now both on YouTube and uh, wherever you're listening to this podcast Josh appreciate it man you got it. Thank you. And it's Josh Ward every single Wednesday right here on the show for a little Ward Wednesday action. Hey, that's going to do it for this edition of Locked On Vols. Big thanks to Josh Ward for joining the show. Big thanks to David Schultz for a little Locked On crossover edition. Uh, Locked On Sun Devil or Locked On uh, Sun Belt, excuse me, and giving us a, a good uh, indication on who exactly Louisiana is. So all that and more coming up for tomorrow's a uh, big showdown for the uh, Tennessee Volunteers and Louisiana in the NCAA tournaments. We'll continue to break that down. We will look towards spring practice. All that and more the next two days right here on Locked On Vols. Make Locked On College Basketball your second listen right behind Locked On Vols. No better time than Locked On College Basketball right now for tournament time. NCAA tournament is here. And get all that action. Make that your second listen over at Locked On College Basketball right behind Locked On Vols. As always, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, subscribe to wherever you uh, listen to us, but especially on YouTube. And we'll try to get tomorrow. This is Locked on Vols. <laughs>